This is the Third Heaven Traveler, Andrew Sheets, with you here this morning. I am so excited about this blog, making it a video. It, uh, this is one I've been wanting to do for a very, very long time. I've taken a lot of studies. Uh, this is over a period of probably four or five years of research. Uh, one of these blogs go back to actually seven years and 2017. Uh, I'm sorry, 2015, so that's like seven years now. And uh, But anyway, dear Heavenly Father, thank you that I get to share this blog, this lengthy study that I'm going to compact in this. Lord, I pray that this introduction, there may be eyes to see, ears to hear, Lord, that those who are meant to get this message get it. And Father, I rebuke the mockers, scoffers, uh, but, Lord, if there are those out there who are not saved and who are hungry and looking, Father, open the eyes of the understanding. I pray, Lord, you call them now. May they find you now. Time is short. And if you are an unbeliever and you want to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, simply believe this, that Jesus Christ, he came and died on the cross for your sins. He was buried according to the scriptures, and rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. Amen. Believe this alone. You're saved. Now, the discipleship, meaning your sanctification process of becoming a child of God, a soldier for Christ, his disciple takes years, and it's developing as you study his word, the King James Bible, and once you truly belong to him, you may fall like what happened to me and others I know. You may follow after some wrong teaching, and then after a while it doesn't make sense. And then you'll say, this is not my master's calling. This is not where I belong. And you'll find it. You'll see it. You'll walk out. Amen. This teaching today, this blog, is for directed to and for the saints. For the saints. This is the sign of Jonah for our time, saints. The sign of Jonah. Jonah chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. This is so powerful. If we follow after wrong teaching and stay in it to where we ascribe to and apprehend and parrot the wrong teaching and galvanize in that wrong teaching, we're forsaking our own vanities. because we're, we're, we're forsaking our own mercy. And what are lying vanities? Lying vanities, if you go to Colossians, open this with me, believer. Uh, open up your Bible to Colossians chapter 2. I'm going there now. And look at verse... Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you. Spoil means take you as a treasure, a trophy in war. So that's Satan taking you out. And being man being used by Satan to take you out. The, you through philosophy. Philosophy is man's wisdom. And vain deceit. Deceit are lies and trickery. Vain is completely worthless lies. After the tradition of men, that means it's been in my church, my family, we believe this for three centuries. I ain't changing. Uh huh. Uh, my Baptist beliefs, my Methodist beliefs, my Presbyterian beliefs, oh, the Holy Catholic Church, or whatever. That's all tradition of men. My 501, my beloved pastor. Uh huh. After the rudiments, which means the rules of the world, and not after Christ. That's vanities. If you observe, meaning to live, follow those vanities, you forsake your own mercy. It happened to Jonah. Jonah cries out. And we're going to study that. And Jonah is the sign for our time. I only use King James Bible. You know this. If this is the first time you've come to my YouTube video, my blogs, you find out why. If you're not 
run from your perverted satanic. Yes, your NASB is satanic. No, it, say it's not so. Oh, yes. Your ESV, NIV, New Living Translation, whatever you've got, if it's not the King James. Oh, I've got a new King James. No, it's not. It's even as bad as, in some cases, even trickier. I've done my research. Read the links. Read the issues related to the Laodicean church today. Although this is written to the saints, and I already said, if you're not saved, I already talked about that. Um, this study is very extensive. I have volumes of background information in this. I ask you to take the time and study all the aspects and understand the deeper meaning because this purpose, the purpose of this study is twofold. It's to give you, the saints, a deeper understanding of the reality and purpose of our current roles in Christ as the body of Christ and the soon coming future role as we rule with Christ along with the tribulation saints in Israel, meaning the Jewish remnant that's gone through the tribulation. But it's also... This is to gain a deeper appreciation of prophecy, a, <clears throat> a deeper understanding of prophecy, and to get the saints to look up, look up for redemption and not down to this world and the things and cares and concerns of this world, which is the goal of Satan. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 4 through 15. Read that now. Take the time, please. If you have to, uh, yeah, actually stop, pause this video and just read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 through 15, please. In understanding these scriptures, I want to give you quick background. If you don't know, I came out of years and years, over 50 years of attending brick and mortar churches, I came out of the Nar Dominion theology, the evangelical movement, the Zionist movement. Uh, I was in it. The prosperity gospel. I was their I was their poster boy. And I fully understand that the Jews require signs. The Greeks in context meanings learned Gentiles, the secular world, they seek after wis wisdom and the philosophy, logic, but not spiritual things. I understand. That the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolish to the Greeks. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 22 through 24, I understand that the church is not a brick and mortar 501c3 building run by apostate trained CEOs called pastors, but the church is the true body of Christ, the saints. We live by faith. We're not going by moeds and keeping feast days in this realm. We're not looking for signs. But I, I, I want you to understand, we, but we do have, as the body of Christ, a very unique and blessed opportunity to see the big picture and, so that we can be aware of our, our season and the time. Yes, I am a date setter. I don't apologize to you, mocker, scoffer. I'll, in your face, I mock you. I set dates every day. Our rapture, our redemption is imminent. I set especially high watch times, which we're coming into, I believe, in the spring. See my study below on how I debunk the parrots. No man knows the day or hour. Continuing on, the sign of Jonah is addressed by Jesus. Read Matthew chapter 12, 38. Get the background why Jesus said, except for the sign of Jonah. See how Jesus told the Pharisees that the sign of Jonah would be a prophetic foreshadow. Now, we know that this is the sign of Jonah, is the topology of his death, his burial and resurrection. Of course, this is undeniable. However, what many forget is this prophecy is also a sure sign. It's a milestone of the end times. 
just like Matthew 24 is a milestone. Matthew chapter 24 is the tribulation people, but we can still see these signs and we know when the tribulation kicks up, we're out of here before. So do you get it? Is it? Does it take a rocket scientist? No, it doesn't. We see it. Too many scholars, they get off the bus and uh, at the bus stop, as I say, at the, G, at the burial resurrection of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. Too many saints don't bother to look deeper into the scripture. My prayer is that the study edifies the body of Christ and inspires us to read our Bibles more, to prove ourselves good workmen of the Lord and strive lawfully to fight a good fight for our crowns. Yes, amen, Maranatha. The sign of Jonah for our time in this late hour is threefold. And it's connected in three steps. To begin with the background, and in the final step to explain the future of what we, our future role is in reigning with Christ. And that's now at the doorstep. So let's talk about these three steps. One, Jesus in the sign of Jonah, he's cursed the Pharisees and the Pharisaical system, the nation, the governmental structure, the Luciferian elite, the Zionists structure these rabbis uh, who are now I say these Zionists these devout rabbis these Orthodox Jews they want nothing to do with Zionism no they understand they know I'm so I'm addressing national Israel in this pharisaical system the ones who say they're Jews but they're not but the synagogue of Satan I'm addressing you they've been accused of Jesus Christ of being Satan, they've rejected him as their Messiah. And in this sentencing, the indictment upon the Pharisees, these stiff-necked Jews, up to today, national Israel, they refuse to see, and this includes the Orthodox Jews, they refuse to see that their Messiah is Jesus Christ, that Yeshua HaMashiach is the Mashiach. They deny that, and they have forsaken their own mercy. Now, you have Messianic Jews who have a terrible identity crisis. They're forsaken their own mercy because they're in the wrong dispensation. They don't know if they're Jew or Gentile. They get it all mixed up. They say, well, Jew first, Christian. They don't know. But that's, I'll talk of this later. But now, take a moment and read the book of Jonah to fully understand what Jesus meant when he cursed the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 45. Then read the next chapter, Matthew 13, then Matthew 23, then read John chapter 8, verses 42 through 45. And take a moment to understand this with the study I have here that I've done on the parable kingdom of the sower in Matthew 13. And as a side note, the reason why I list John 8 you know why these people, these scoffers, mockers, people used to preaching the wrong gospel who honestly think we're in the kingdom gospel, or these messianic Jews who think that uh, the church will go through Jacob or the time of Jacob's trouble, and that there is no rapture, and that our whole second advent is when they're established, and there is no time of Jacob's trouble. You know what they're doing? The reason they can't see the truth is because the truth is not in them. If the, truth, if the truth were in these people, they wouldn't ask. They wouldn't know. As the Pharisees, Jesus told these Pharisees, I told you who I am. And you keep asking me. I told you that before Abraham was, I am. This is the Godhead, not the Trinity people, by the way. It's a whole thing on this. This is foundational. But they don't see it because the truth is not in them. Only a small remnant sees this. The saints. That's who I'm addressing. But guess what? Jesus said, you are of your father, Satan. The reason why Satan, he's the father of lies, a murder from the beginning. You can't see the truth because the truth is not in you. Read that. Study it. I plead with you. Read my link on Christians have to understand the kingdom of God. And I have in there, what's the kingdom of heaven? That's the physical realm. 
the Davidic kingdom, which will be physically on earth, not as these priests teach, these reprobates teach that, oh, no, that's all behind us. We're now in the kingdom. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. I dealt with a gentleman the other day. He is, like, freaking out that I can't see that the Antichrist, all that's come past. That's all done. We're now in the kingdom age. Yep, I'm, I'm not joking. They can't see that the kingdom of heaven is physical. It's all spiritual. They call Israel the the... They say the church is spiritual. Israel is different. They get into the spiritual Israel, the, the physical Israel, and that's a big mess. The church is a separate entity from Israel. But the church, we are grafted into Abraham, and we'll talk about that. But I urge you to read and understand Romans chapter 9 through 11 to understand why Paul makes a three-chapter set-aside, a literary interlude here, and he stops addressing the church. And he begins to explain to Israel, directly to the Jews, that Israel, that all Israel be saved. You know who that is? That's only one-third. That's only one-third, the remnant. Yeah, unrepentant Israel will go through the time of Jacob's trouble and only a remnant, one third of them will come out. Messianic Jews, evangelical Zionists refuse to discuss this. Read carefully Romans chapter 9 verses 20 through 27. Hosea chapter 1, 10 and 11. Zechariah 13, 9. Micah 2.12, Isaiah 51, that's Isaiah chapter 50 verse 1, Jeremiah chapter 11 verse 14, Revelation chapter 2 verse 9, Revelation 3 chapter 3 verse 9. Take a moment and study that Messianic Jews have a major identity problem. Study my links. Hey, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, and that may, Messianic Jews have a major identity problem. See this whole thing I have on Ask Dr. Brown. Take time to talk about Zionism from a Christian perspective. I have. Please read that. The third, the third part of understanding the Uh, sign of Jonah here is the third part is Peter and Peter's declaration at Pentecost which for you Sabbath keepers you despicable sad Sabbath keepers okay now the reason why I say despicable he's sad you want to keep the Sabbath you want to keep laws you're Judaizers and then you try to saddle me with that and others of us hey if you want to keep the Sabbath that's fine, but don't tell me that that's, I have to do that to be in Christ. Because you're not reading scriptures and Colossians, I'm told not, you You can't tell me what, what holy day, high day festival I have to keep in this realm with the body of Christ. I'm not under that. Sunday is not a pagan day, the sun worshiping the sun. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, days of the week, yep, came from pagan, yep, okay. Easter, it's in the King James Bible. Oh, pagan, pagan, no. The Passover time, it was hijacked by the pagans, yes. Christmas was hijacked by the pagans, yes. To go and pick these holidays and say, e -e -e, you can't even say the Easter word. I'm getting off subject here, but... Focus on Pentecost happened on a Sunday. Focus on John being taken up to the third heaven to write Revelation happened on a Sunday. But this marker in Acts chapter 2 verses 24 through 36 is to declare, Hey y'all, the 69th week of Daniel 9, 27 that's Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, has been fulfilled, and the remaining one week, which is seven years to fulfill, 
would and fulfill the Joel chapter two prophecy is ahead of us. It, it, uh, that's what Peter's declaring, and this is the Pentecost, and the key word is here Shavuot, which is the feast of weeks, the weeks of sevens. Leviticus chapter twenty three fifteen through seventeen. Read Daniel chapter nine. Read where the fulfillment of the building and the actual rebuilding of the first temple through the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ brings us to the 69th completion, I should say, the 69th week of the 70 weeks completed. That remaining week is yet to be fulfilled, which is seven weeks or seven years of the tribulation, also known as the time of Jacob's trouble, also known as the day of the Lord. Not the Lord's day. The Lord's day is Sunday. Day of the Lord is the tribulation. The day of Christ is the rapture. It's shocking some of the comments I get. People can't uh, understand that why they don't study it. They just squawk something they've heard from a false teacher. Also, I have to stop here. See my study on who the he is of Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. And please stop this foolish reprobates, this foolish and wicked teaching that Jesus Christ is the Antichrist, spoken of in Daniel 9.27, and that the tribulation is only three and a half years, not seven. See my link on that, who he is. Uh, we, we shouldn't even be having this conversation. If you're a saint and you belong to Christ and you can't see that, then you need to say, am I really a saint? Seriously? And I want to stop here as a side note. If you say, who are you to say who the saints are? It proves that you do not know the word of God and who a saint is. And we know all spiritual things. Yes, we know the things of the spirit, the things of God. We know who we are in Christ. I'm going to talk about this later. So anyway, within Acts chapter 2, verse 24 through 36, we have this entire roadmap laid out for us. But we have to understand. We have to be able to understand Psalms chapter 2. We have to read and understand Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 19, 15, and Daniel chapter 9. It's within the context of these scriptures together, we find out how Jesus Christ... Our kinsman redeemer, please read that study I have. King David and the body of Christ are all intertwined in typology and actual, literal, physical fulfillment of three additional scriptures of Exodus chapter 19, verse 11, John chapter 2, verse 1, and John 21 verse 14 to ultimately fulfill Hosea chapter 6 verse 2. Hosea chapter 6 verse 2 is the completion of the sign of Jonah. Jesus' resurrection was only the beginning of the fulfillment. Yes, that too many Bible scholars and these fake, false, reprobate pastors called fakes they call themselves pastors ceos they lead and misguide their flocks it's the blind leading the blind note the high priest accused samuel's mother hannah of being drunk this poor woman was crying bitterly tears just wrenched her heart was wrenched each year she when she went to the temple at the high time she uh, it, it, in the um, um, in the time she would come in, I don't know exactly what it may have been, what feast day it was. I don't. Anyway, she would go to the temple every year and would just cry her heart out, pleading that God would hear her prayer and give her a son. And the priest one day saw her mumbling and crying out to the Lord and thought she was drunk. She said, I'm not drunk. The same thing happened to Peter. He was accused of being drunk in Acts chapter 2. This is a huge significance for the meaning of the body of Christ. Do you know that Hannah's mother 
birthed the kingmaker. And connect the dots with that sometime with Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. It will blow your mind. Whenever there is a tremendous breakthrough in the spiritual world and manifests itself in the flesh, the accuser of the brethren, which is Satan, he uses his mo his pawns, his little minions, to mock those who have the anointing. What Peter is saying in Acts 2 is utterly profound, and he gives us Satan the perfect picture of the end day, the tribulation of time of Jacob's trouble. And right now, we see we're coming into that window right now. Now, let's talk about Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the whale or large shark. Um, it says fish, so, I mean, it could be a massive uh, great white. doesn't matter, but he was swallowed, and he was in that belly for three days and three nights. Now, when Jonah was in the belly, Jonah drowned. Jonah was drowned dead, deader than a doornail inside of the belly of that fish. Please. You need to stop drinking milk if you really believe in your childhood memories of your Bible teacher showing you here is a poor little Jonah walking around the belly of this big whale. He was not walking around. He was laying there dead. And this also has tremendous typology with we're dead in Christ. We're dead in Christ. We're, I'm sorry, we're crucified with Christ but alive into him. And, and we live because we're dead to sin and alive into righteousness. There's a whole study in that. But anyway, the, I'm going to read some of the details on this. But Jonah is literally speaking to God from Sheol, from hell, which is not the, the suffering, the brimstone, suffering brimstone of hell. This is the paradise or Abraham's bosom side of hell or Sheol. And I'll show you the link here. And we also read that Jonah, we also know because I'm going to show you where we can find this in this study. He was, Jonah died there in Nineveh later. And he was buried there and his sepulcher was there until this day. Until I'm going to show you what happened. But we can see this, that this is the perfect, perfect example of God's extraordinary display of using whomever to accomplish his will. And that afterwards, Jonah's rage and, and shocking, his displeasure and rage to God ended his purpose right there. I, I believe as this one Bible teacher, this old, old man, 90, he's in his 90s now, I've lost track of him. But I believe like he does that that was a sin unto death. And what we have what Paul calls the Old Testament examples given to us as lessons learned. Now, study my link here, please, on lessons learned and why these are essential tools for the body of Christ. I take an example, this Russ Dizdar phenomenon, I call him the man who is not striving lawfully. I have a two-part series. I just pulled one part, the second part, to study the essential tools of examples. The This man, Russ Dizdar, was preaching another gospel. He was in the wrong dispensation. He was still under teaching the, that the body of Christ is under the an apostolic anointing, which is not. And uh, he had his followers chasing these literal, we got to go hunt demons and we got to go uh, cast out demons and we have to go slay them and take over the world. We got to establish the world for God. And we could move into the tribulation. He was leading his flock into the tribulation. It was so insane, but yet this powerful man had a, had a charisma about him, of course, that the people, now he did good things, of course, in his teaching, but the purpose of this video is not to go into the Russ Dizdar issue. It's about the sign of Jonah. But this is essential to understand that this man was striving unlawfully. And I have the whole thing here. And why we must see why he, this man died suddenly, unexpectedly, and 
there's all these rumors abounding. And I think the guy died from COVID and he was an avid staunchly against any vaccine. And I don't care if you get the vax or not. It doesn't matter to me. It's not a real, it's not an issue where some foolish Christians think, oh, if you take the mark, you're taking the mark of the beast. It, it's insane. No, if you want to take the vaccine, fine. If you don't, fine. It doesn't matter. This is what being caught up with foolish arguments is all about. Things that are not essential. But anyway, whatever it was, he was striving unlawfully. He was doing some very bad things, and he, he was taken out. And a, some sister in Christ gave me some very good information on this. But anyway, read that. Also, please see the prophetic significance. In 2014, ISIS uh, destroyed Jonah, Jonah's tomb. Now, I don't know if anyone listening to this remembers that. But I really studied that carefully. This is going back 2014. My God, this is uh, six, seven, eight years ago now. That had prophetic implications because those, they knew. They knew. They had to get rid of this. Anyway, separate subject, but there's still prophetic implications of Jonah here. Uh, I'm going to read just briefly an excerpt from the sign of Jonah that this preacher Bible study Bible guy did and it, the only thing I don't like about God bless his work however I don't like the way he used in the threes in his link he did list the Trinity as an example now he was the only saying Trinity because there's three in one which is pagan not the man this man was very wrong but he did do a very good study on Jonah was was dead. We have that, and you can read it here. And but th I think this is interesting. And then, if anyone's ever studied a little bit about the digestive system of living creatures, they know that the digestive system breaks down food received into the stomach by means of hydrochloric acid. Yeah, so we can only assume that this big fish had a lot of hydrochloric acid. So Jonah's laying there. Down in there, his body was not re, re his physical body was not in a glorified state when God had the fish spit him out. So his body would have been partially decomposed when he was vomited out. So you can imagine he probably had hair missing. He probably had chunks of his white, his outer layers of skin would have been. And I like the way this Francis he. Riley writes, he says his flesh, his feet, he would have been, his body would have appeared to be deeply red, other parts bruised blue, green, ghastly. His appearance would have been absolutely hideous to the men of Nineveh. They would have, he would have looked like a monster walking around. Yeah, he got people's attention. Oh, definitely. And we see that this was like Christ. That he would have been, Christ, after they beat and whipped and put the crown of thorns on him, before they crucified him, Christ was terribly marred. And I'm glad that, that this Bible teacher did this to look at. And as we know of the three days and three nights represent Jesus Christ, Jonah went into Sheol. So did Jesus Christ. And so did David. And so are we as Christians, meaning we are dead, to, we are crucified with Christ. We have to go to the Christ. We have to be dead to sin and alive into righteousness. It's the same thing. It applies to us. Now let's talk about King David here. We know King David is both a type of Christ. We see that we see the typology here, but literally this is also referring to him in the sign of Jonah. Well, first of all, not only did the Spirit of God give Jonah the utterance from Sheol to cry out, meaning his body's dead, but his soul's alive there in the bosom. In the bosom. Did I, I want to go back here. Did I list? Uh, oh, I will, oh, okay. I have describing Sheol. Okay. Yeah, I've got sh describing Sheol here. They, so, they, so not only did Jonah cry out 
from Shoal, but his words were recorded in David, which was 300 years earlier. The exact words, how the Spirit wrote the same words and would be fulfilled by David both and Christ Jesus literally 700 years after David. The same language. What is stunning is David will also personally fulfill the full and final resurrection again at the mid-tribulation and lead the remnant out of Israel to Petra. I will say this again. Study shows, when you study scripture with scripture, that David is a type of Christ. We know this. Christ cried out, By my father, why hast thou forsaken me? He, David, he says, thou has literal quotes. He, uh, Jonah quotes David literally. The waves have passed over me. I cry out. Jesus Christ says this literally. Here it is in Psalms 42. Psalms 88. Let, let's just do this real quick. Let's go to Psalms chapter. If you could go with me. Psalms in your King James Bible. Psalms 42. And verse 6 and 7. Let's see here. Yeah, it says here. It says, Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and from the, Hermom the Hermomonites and the hill of Misar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts and the waves and thy billows are gone over me. This is repeated in, by Jonah. 300 years after David and another 700 years later in Christ. This is a type, the type of Christ here. Uh, and let's see if I have the, let's see. Yeah. So we see specifically that David will also, he will come back to life at the mid trib and just as Jonah was spit out, David will literally come out of his sepulcher there in Jerusalem and literally lead the remnant, the one-third remnant out of Israel at the middle of the tribulation. This is happening in uh, Revelation chapter 5. Uh, direction, I'm sorry, Revelation 12. Let's proceed. To understand Shoal, we have to understand there's a really good study I did about the rich man and Lazarus, which is not a parable. Names are being used. I have the whole study here. Read it. And I actually have a map there of what Shoal looks like. And we have the perfect picture of the gap between the hell of suffering, Hades, Shoal, and then Abraham's bosom, which is paradise. It, it shows you. That's where Jonah went. That's where David went, literally, and that's where Jesus Christ went from, for three days and three nights, and I'll show you here later. But to understand the connection of David with the sign of Jonah, read Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. Read 2 Samuel chapter 7, specifically chapter 7 verses 16 verses 23 and 25 read Micah chapter 2 verse 13 and um, see how Samuel second Samuel chapter 7 establishes the ark from Moses the tabernacle of Moses think of Egypt think of Moses leading the children of Israel the Hebrew children out of bondage and destruction from Egypt. Look at David with the new covenant, which represents, represents from the law to grace, taking, leading the remnant out of Israel to Petra to keep him safe from the Antichrist. The Pharaoh was a type of Antichrist. The actual Antichrist will be on earth 
he's already faked the Jews out. He had a false covenant. He confirmed a covenant for seven years. In the middle, he breaks it. He comes after them with his forces to annihilate them, to wipe them out. Their backs are against the wall, just like Israel was the Jordan. And the crossover, that crossover is David leading them. David is a shadow of the tabernacle of Moses. Is so important to see this. This is also establishes how God uses man to execute his rule. In Psalms 42 and Psalms 88, read Psalms chapter 2 and 23, Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 through 17, Exodus chapter 19, verse 11, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, and Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. See the connection between Moses and Jesus. Study Joel chapter 2. Verse 32, Zechariah 13, 9. And as I said before, this ties in is Romans chapter 10, uh, 24 through 27, Hosea chapter 1, and Daniel chapter 9, 24. Look at the tabernacles of Moses and David. Do your research. Okay, King David entered Shoal upon his death, no doubt. Do you know that David and was among, no doubt, I'm sure, but we know they were Old Testament saints. And this plays in, their graves, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the graves of the Old Testament saints, of many Old Testament saints, they opened. They did not come out. They just opened. They broke open. These sepulchers were cracked open. Who knows? Broken open. And then when Jesus Christ was resurrected he ascended uh, correction let me back up here at the death and burial of jesus christ the graves of the old testament saints were broken open when jesus christ was raised from the dead after three days these old testament saints walked around they were hanging out in jerusalem it's recorded in matthew chapter 27 verses 51 through 53. Now, some foolish scholars think and write, and I, 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 their logic just is astounding, that these Old Testament saints lived out another life. Certainly that wouldn't have happened. There would have, have been historical evidence. Uh, it, it would have been a mess. And we would have seen scriptural evidence. No, I think when Jesus ascended to heaven, the ascension, which was 40 days after where 500 saw him when Jesus ascended to the heaven. He went back up to heaven, the third heaven, into the spiritual realm with the Father, which is spirit. Jesus is not an old man sitting up there on a throne. Separate subject. But when Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, I think the Old Testament, these Old Testament saints went back to their sepulchers. And it could have been... They just hung out for a day or so, a couple hours. I don't know. But anyway, we know that David could very most likely been, because we're going to see it again, walking around, being used. Just like Jonah's body was animated again from Shoal and walked around and preached and did what he was supposed to do. We know from scripture taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52, these Old Testament saints would not have been given eternal, immortal life and glorified bodies. That's the church, not them. But since Scripture does not tell us these saints, what happened to these saints, we, as I said, we can believe that they eventually died again, but they were just temporary, okay? The main point here is I want you to understand that King David will be resurrected again at the mid-tribulation and here's the scripture and he will lead the Jewish remnant out of Judea into Petra the scriptures are all here and I have other links uh, Daniel chapter 2 verses 2 and 3 Micah chapter 2 verses 12 and 13 Hosea chapter 1 verses 10 and 11 Psalms chapter 2 Revelation chapter 12, verses 5 through 7, 
and Revelation, actually Revelation chapter 12, if you go actually all the way to the end of chapter 12, you can see that play in there. Uh, Act, I already talked about this, Acts 2, 24, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 6, Psalms chapter 16, verse 10, Psalms chapter 30, verse 3, Psalm 49, 14, and 15, 55, 15, 86, 13, and I already said Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 7 and 9, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and specifically 7, 16, 23, 25, and Micah cha uh, chapter 2, verse 13. See these notes below. Okay. Jesus Christ, a must read, talking about the sign of Jonah, talking about the end times after the rapture of the church, you must read when we come back with him, when David has taken the remnant out, the king in combat by Matt Lesher in 2017. Oh my God, it's powerful. People have this understanding that this Jesus Christ is this lovey-dovey guy, my God. And they say, no, no, he came as the servant. He was the suffering servant on his first advent when he came. Yes. But even then, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's continue. We have to know. Read the king in combat. It's it's shocking, stunning. It's It's powerful. Read that we have to understand who Jesus Christ is. And, you know, and, and it was by God's grace I met my brother in Christ, Daryl Gass, who confirmed what I had always known for years. I had several blogs on, look, folks, Trinity is pagan. you got to be kidding me. There are not three gods. There's not three persons. It's only one person, which is a body. And I have all the, the proof, defin, defined proof that there's only one God. And if we understand Jesus as a person of the pagan trinity, we're preaching another Jesus. This is a foundational proof. Read my study here. Far too many Christians see this Jesus as God the Son, which is pagan. Far too many Christians they're calling themselves Christians. They see Jesus Christ as this wimpy, lovey, dovey, sappy, soy boy who walked the earth giving out love hugs. Group hugs, y'all. Come over here. Wow. And what, wh where do they get this? This is portrayed in large part from the Renaissance painters commissioned by the Vatican to make this effeminate, long-haired, soft man who's portrayed as this Hollywood softy, lovey-dovey. And, and if you really, it's amazing. Take tough love and truth of what Jesus spoke when he was on earth, man. Read my study. Come meet my kinsman redeemer. This dispels the myth, people. The wrong doctrine of the pre-incarnate Jesus. There, there's no such thing as a pre-incarnate Jesus. Jesus Christ has existed from eternity as the visible image of God. Do you think if you could interview Jacob and say, were you wrestling with this spirit, an angel? He would say, no, it was a strong man in bodily form. How about when the captain of the army Jesus Christ himself stood there in front of Jonah and Jonah was like seeing this man with his sword drawn and wanted to know, are you with them or are you on our side? And he says, hey, I'm of Israel. I'm the captain of the guard, man. Jonah fell down, man. He was like worshiping. He knew that he was talking to God. Know the truth is to know love, understanding biblical love and harmonize with hatred? What? Oh, no, don't, don't, no. Hate is don't. Jesus is the visible image of God. God said, 
Jacob I love, Esau I hate. You should see these false, fake, reprobate teachers trying to say that the Bible really doesn't mean what it says. No. It says hate. The imprecations that David speaks in the Psalms are there. See how Trinity is pagan, of polytheism, it's Baal worship. Understand the Feast of Weeks and how the first fruits, and really we have to understand the first fruits. Understand that the Pentecost, as I said up here, let me scroll up. When Peter made his great announcement, the Spirit of the Lord came on Peter. It was Pentecost, the Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, the first fruit. Jesus Christ is the first fruit. It's all in here. Study that. We have to know who Jesus Christ is. Scroll down, scroll down. And yes, he fulfilled the sign of Jonah. He was crucified, marred. His body was just destroyed. And, what, and, and, and it was like Jonah, he freaked people out when they looked at him, no doubt. He went down into Sheol and took the keys from hell and death. It's in, stop, re read that right here. I love that in Revelation. Go to Revelation here. Look at how it opens up in Revelation. If we could open up, uh, take your Bible, please, with me. Open up your King James Bible. And it says right here, it says, and it says, um, chapter 1, verse 8. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Whew. He took those keys when he was in Sheol. That was a legal right to take that from Satan when Adam and Eve fell in the garden. Satan had that, had that control of death. That's no longer Jesus Christ has those keys. Amen. <sighs> Praise God. So understand the Feast of Weeks. And then the Feast of Weeks is called Pentecost in the New Testament. How important that is. And the connection of Pentecost, the 50th day after the resurrection, how that connects with when Moses went up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. Know that also, I want to talk again about Godhead versus Trinity. Why would God say, or why would Jesus Christ tell the Pharisees before Abraham was, past tense, I am? Didn't we hear that before? I am that I am. Tell them sent you. That's God. That is the spirit of God the Father in the Son, who is the physical, visible image of God, okay? But read and study the works of Moses and Mount Sinai and how the Israelites crossed the Red Sea and arrived at Mount Sinai on the first day of the month in the sacred year, and they were in the desert 40. Hello, Jesus was on earth 40 days. The connections are just amazing. Okay, the saints. We will rule with Christ. We are now, right now, right now in this age in dispensation, dear saint. We are in Christ, sitting in, not with, in. We exist in him, in his throne, on in the third heaven, in heavenly places. Yes. We are his ambassador. We move in him. He directs us. We're the salt and light of this earth. Yes. But this is just now. But literally, we will rule with him. Please, you must read my link. It would take an hour just to do this study alone. And we will literally rule with Christ. And read how Psalms, First uh, Corinthians Chapter 6, 1 through 20, Matthew 25, 31 through 46, read Psalms 2, read Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. I cannot take the time in this video or in this blog to do an hour study on why the saint, we are raptured in Revelation 12, 5. That's the body of Christ. That's not 
Jesus who's brought up. Jesus was not raptured. Jesus ascended. We're caught up. Harpazo's in there. Anyway, do your research. Psalms 2, which is connected with Revelation 12 and 12.5, gives us a terrifying account of how fierce the reign of Jesus Christ is. And we, with him, in him, are administering justice during the millennial reign, all the way through into the eternal kingdom. But the Bible doesn't stress that we're just talking now about the millennial reign, the thousand year reign. And we see, we saints, we're with him. And we are complete within him and he in us. And when we are literally physically walking around in the millennial reign in our glorified bodies, we are spiritually, of course, connected with him, but we're literally walking around separate and apart from him. Okay. This is perfectly harmonized with Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 through 21, Ephesians chapter 2, 5 and 6, which clearly tells us that we're raised up together and with him and far above all principality, power, and might. We have dominion, not only in this world, but in the world to come. We must know precisely who we are in Romans 8, 16. And those few of us that have come to Christ, believe me, it's very narrow. Read Matthew 13, Matthew 22. If you read Matthew 13, 23, the parable of the sower, you know that as in time progresses and the, the Laodicean church, it's fewer and fewer of the remnant are really his and saved. Yes, please read my study on that. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 30. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We And we did not come to him. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He predestined us to be his children according to his will. Read Ephesians 1. Read Romans 8, 29. But most importantly, Jesus Christ knows who are his. 2 Timothy 2, 19. And we know, the Spirit knows people. And the mind understands that we are his. Read Romans 8, 16, 17. When our Lord called us, we fell down before our master's feet as if dead as John did in Revelation 1.17. We soon learned that we had to come to the cross and die to self by humbling ourselves as did Naaman. Yes, did in 2 Kings chapter 5, who humbled himself willingly and fell on the foundation rock we by faith believed our Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins, was buried according to the scriptures, and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Amen. We believe that. We know that we don't have to do works and signs of repentance. And stop on this. I get attacked all the time saying, we don't. are you saying we don't have to repent to come to Jesus to be saved? I'm saying... And the gospel of Paul teaches us that you don't have to be baptized and do repentance to be saved. You have to believe. Now, of course, it's understood. And I know that you other believers are out there joining me on this. As I write, oh, trust me, when we had the hand of our master touch us and we fell down before him, oh, our heart was broken. Oh, yes. But when we believe we are in Christ, when we once believe that by his work, it's finished. All that's done. We then take our cross and we're crucified with our Lord, Galatians 2.20. Our crucifixion is our refining fire through the furnace of affliction in Romans 5, 3 and 5, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 18. And like I said, we are now in heavenly places in Ephesians 1, and we will soon be transformed into his likeness. When he calls us and meets us in the air in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 53, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16, 18. And here very soon, amen, we know the times we live in. We saints truly know by the Spirit all things spiritual. Read, read this, read this in John and in 1 Corinthians. We know who Jesus Christ is, is our foundation. We don't chase after a false 
Baal worship three gods in one that they call three persons in one. No, we know there's only one person, one body, and that one body is has the spirit of God, which is the spirit of Jesus Christ himself. Amen. And we know that the fullness of the Godhead dwells in our Jesus Christ in first in Colossians 1 15 Colossians 2 9 We don't follow after the vain philosophy of man, which is stoic philosophy after bow worship It's read my links there, please We know the King James Bible is our final authority. We know we will rule with Christ Now that's what I want to go into now We must understand now Something that's difficult and hard for many Christians to understand is that we have to have our crowns to rule with Christ. Now, let me say this. I'm going to stress this very, very carefully. I'm going to repeat this. Crowns are important. Just being truly saved and coming to Christ, we already know, we know that we've finished and we come to Christ and we will receive our crown um, they I'm sorry I'm sorry just drew a blank I'm sorry we, we know that we're going to actually receive a crown of being saved and that means we come to Jesus Christ as his and hold on uh, I just I have Memorize the crowns, memorize the crowns, memorize the crowns. I just, uh, yeah, our crown of life, our crown of life. We know that we'll have our crown of life because that is means basic, that's being saved. And now many believe that the crown of life means a martyr. It can mean a martyr's life, but that's differentiated differently, and I don't really want or need to go into that right now. But all of us will not receive all the same crowns. Let's go through this right now. We have to understand that there's a crown of righteousness. That's those who love the appearing of Jesus Christ, who look for the rapture, who's excited about this daily. It's 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 8, verse 8. Then there's the crown of life, and that's in James chapter 1, verse 12. That's called the martyr's crown, but honestly, the crown of life, it says here, let's read it in James, are we in James here? Hold on, hold on, let's read this together. Uh, verse 12, I'm sorry. And blessed is a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he receive a crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Okay, this, I don't know why some people have taken this to be a martyr's crown. Now, it could be in part, but this is promised. If you love Jesus Christ, truly love him, you are his and he is yours, right? And I can't take the time in this study, but there's an in-depth study. I, I encourage you to look at this deeper. And I have in this crown, if you are saved, you are going to get this crown. Now, the temptation truly is enduring that temptation, but we're told that we're promised them that love him. The temptation is Satan trying to tell us the lies of, of, of Jesus isn't real. He really doesn't love you. You're not saved, it, not of questioning eternal salvation in this. But to be God's child, to be belong to Christ, to be his blood-bought born again, we're looking at the crown of life. Uh, the crown <clears throat> of glory, this often has been told this is for people um, who's finished their work well this one here if you're looking at the crown of glory to really finish your work if you have been called 
to do something and you have not finished what you've been set out to do. Let's read this right here. In 1 Peter chapter 5, this is the crown of glory. It says, And neither has the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory. Now, um, this go back up here is, it's among you, the elder sufferings of Christ, partaker of his glory to be revealed. The flock taking oversight there, that be willing, but uh, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a clown of glory that takes us not away. So let me just stop here, and I want to go into the crown of glory. Uh, hold on one second here. I got the link. Thank you for bearing with me here. I didn't have my notes for you. Okay. Um, this, and I like this, this link here I have in here. The greatest achievement is to fulfill your calling and finish. Here it is. To finish the work God gave you. The, when we get our rewards, the chief shepherd's going to look at you and say, did you do what? you've been given to do and not all Christians will there are many Christians who have not done what they're supposed to do they've shirked their duties as in Jonah did but Jonah's case he did it in partial he was forced to but I'm just giving that to an example I don't want to get too deep in this but but bottom line the crown of glory did you finish your job if you didn't you're not going to get that reward at the Bema seat. Does that mean you're not going to be saved? No, you will not get that reward. And then we have the, let's say I did the crown of glory, the crown of joy. Uh, now, this has been called the crown of joy. This is only giving, given to preaching the gospel. I mean, to pastors and preachers. Yeah, well, if they're truly men of God and not, reprobate false teachers but no this is given to anyone who's preaching the gospel anyone that you have the joy of sharing the gospel with that's the crown of joy are you influencing others towards righteousness are you like i say preaching the gospel that's your crown of glory if you've done that and been faithful in that you're going to get a crown of glory and i've already told you the crown of righteousness <clears throat> of the five crowns that's for loving his appearing now i need to talk about the crown the incorruptible crown which is called the crown of the overcomers now this one is huge and i like the way this uh this link here the the whoever wrote this i have it here in the links here and i agree here that of the five crowns mentioned there's different aspects of the Christian life, and there are levels of maturity in regards to growth and accomplishment. Now, the incorruptible crown is without a doubt the first level. That's the highest. This crown indicates mastery, not only over sin nature, and this is what I really want to stress, not only over sin nature, but overcoming an overcomer. Now, think of the word overcomer. I'm going to come back here. And I'm kind of skipping ahead here. When I say overcomer, it's very, very important. I want to say this now. An overcomer is not to be confused with overcoming to be saved. The incorruptible crown is the crown of overcomers. This is critical because it has to do, read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, suffering, which is overcoming. If we look at the word suffering, it's Strong's G5278. It means to preserve under misfortunes and trials. The same language is used in Romans chapter 12, verse 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7, this is for the church. But notice 
G5278 is also used in Matthew 10.22, Matthew 13.13, 13, 24.13, 13, etc. This is not the church. This is applied to the Jews and the tribulation saints. And this is dependent on salvation. Because the church, for the church, overcoming is not a salvation issue. It is a reward issue. And it is an issue of reigning and your position of authority. Now, if you think it doesn't matter what my position is, like that one foolish boy told me, a young man told me, he says, oh, I don't care. I'm going to cast my crowns at his feet. I just want to be, as long as I'm just, uh, I'll be, I'll clean the stables is what he said. And uh, the reason that's ignorant is, first of all, we do not throw our crowns at Christ's feet. I have a whole study on that. The 24 elders do. They represent the church. They are not the actual church members. They're not the actual body of Christ, but they represent us. And I have a whole study on that. So if you think it doesn't matter, then I'm a retired naval officer. Let me tell you on a ship, uh, and I spent in the, my world in the submarine world, I was in the surface Navy world. Let me tell you, on just a nuclear submarine, if you're a low, low rank, a low ranking, non submarine qualified individual, and you want to compare your duties, your life, and quality of life to like a commanding officer or an executive officer or one of the department heads, have fun. I one day I was a department head by God's grace. And one day I'm in the trash disposal unit. And I don't know why I want to break off and share this story. I was in the trash disposal unit, TDU room, on a nuclear submarine. And we, I saw this young man. He was not educated, but he was smart. He was able to get high enough scores to get into the submarine force, which meant, hey, something. But he was slow in getting his quals done. He wasn't ra ra really rated yet. He was a either going for an engineer, I, I should say a diesel mechanic job or a cook's job or something, which not putting those down, that's great. But I'm saying he wasn't even rated in that. He didn't even have the special that. He didn't even go to the school to know how to cook and be a good chef. So he was in the disposal room shredding garbage and to packing it, compacting it to shoot it out into the bottom of the ocean, the smell, the filth, the yuck. And he just looked at me and says, man, I'm going to definitely, I want to go to school. I want to learn. I got to improve my life. Okay. So stop this insanity about it doesn't matter where we're going to be doing for eternity. Our position and authority in Christ matters. And if you don't care, then what does that tell you about you? Seriously. I'll leave it there. The crown of for the overcomer, the incorruptible crown. This is very, very important. If we have this crown, it proves that we've been through the treadmill. He's put us through the mill, people. We've been tried and tested in the most extraordinary circumstances. And we've suffered for Christ. And we overcame, we overcome adversity. And it also includes fleshly attachments. And I'm not getting on anyone uh, having a few, have you have a beer. Okay, someone said, oh, I smoke a cigar. But if you have a vice, a terrible vice, and let the Holy Spirit deal with you on this. I had to overcome alcoholism. I had to overcome personally tobacco. Now, I'm not preaching to you. I'm not getting here of works, works, and I'm not being legalistic. God knows my heart, people. I'm just telling you, this has nothing to do with salvation. But if, <clears throat> but if you're not, but if you have a vice that's continually holding you down and you're, you are truly saved, then it's going to affect your position with Christ. So pray about this. Read this. Don't just take what I'm saying. But study this incorruptible crown, which I think is the most important. Study this. Pray about it and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I couldn't quit tobacco, chewing tobacco for 30-some years until the Lord took me out of it some 20 years ago. 
I couldn't stop alcohol, drinking alcohol in my... Now, okay, there's another issue, and this is about inheriting the kingdom and entering the kingdom. Let me just scroll ahead. So read all my links, study this here. Study how we have to know, to, and, and, you, and study how we have to know what striving lawfully is. And then before I go into inheriting the kingdom versus entering the kingdom, let me say in this, you can pause this. I know this is a very long study. Like I said, I'm trying to unpack years of study that's all connected. And the Lord put this on my heart. To be a good soldier, we have to know our authority and our responsibility. Okay. We have to first strive lawfully. We should want crowns. Uh, Go open your Bible, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's go there. 2 Timothy chapter 2. That's what I should have done. I jumped ahead. I shouldn't have done that. 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's read. Thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit them to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier for Christ. See, we see this, we see this now. We're seeing some overcoming. And it says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, now this is the crown here I'm talking about. Paul here is talking, and I don't hear anyone teaching this. This must be the same, the one and the same crown <coughs> that's the overcomer's crown, the incorruptible crown, because the language is in there. And it says, you're not going to get your crown unless you strive lawfully. What is striving lawfully? Well, we have so many different thinking, and there was this reprobate in the faith that tried to take Phil Potts' teaching strictly <coughs> on what is lawful strife, unlawful strife. It gets way deep in the weeds. Parts of it are good and true, and that's that we cannot do things in our effort, but we have to rely on Christ, be in Christ, and he in us. However, that's not the real, true, bottom line issue. Simple, simple. Striving lawfully, if we continue reading in 2 Timothy chapter 2, means that we have to, for this crown, and we see here Strong's G5278, endure, and there's that same word that comes from, for, that, for the incorruptible crown, endure, and we must suffer. We must do the things for the elect's sake. So we obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Wait a minute. And they're going to say, this is saying that we have to endure or we're not going to be saved. No. Listen, it says we endure all things for the elect's sake that they. So it's saying we have to teach others so that they can obtain salvation in Jesus Christ. So we have to suffer in doing that. Which leads to the other crown. We're looking at our crown of joy. Which also adds to the crown. The finishing work. We get for finishing our work. Uh, let's see. that We suffer. We will suffer. If we suffer. We shall also reign. That means in command with him. If we deny him. He will deny us. Okay now. So we keep going. Of all these things remember. And it says that first we have to study to show ourselves approved unto God that be a workman needs not be ashamed by rightly dividing the word of truth. My God, what that's saying is we have to be using the right dispensation. Rightly dividing the word of truth means you have to be in dispensations. If you're walking around squawking the kingdom gospel as the gospel of Paul, you're not in the right dispensation, which means you're not using the right legal authority, which means you don't know the rules you're operating. You're wandering around aimlessly lost and teaching the blind. You're blind, leading the blind, which means you're not going to get this crown. Okay, let's say you're truly saved, but you say, I don't believe in dispensations, but I'm truly saved. 
which is shocking, hard to believe, but hey. But let's say you're going out doing all these great works. Look what I did. Look what I did. But if you study 1 Corinthians, when you go to the Bema, your works will be burned. You're not going to get crowned. You will not be reigning with him. And then if you're continually living in sin, you got girlfriends on the side, you, 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 you. Uh, let's do entering verses. Let's do this. Let's jump ahead now. So, so first of all, we have to rightly divide to strive lawfully. Next, to inherit the kingdom. This doesn't mean salvation, people. This does not mean salvation. But if we read um, the in 1 Corinthians, if you read in 1 Corinthians here, it says, in 1 Corinthians, it says here, if your brother here do fraud and righteousness, let's see, let's get on here. Let's see, let's see, right, Christ, right, you guys read it. Nope, I'm sorry. The inheriting Galatians, oh, 6, 9, 3, let's read Galatians first. It says, now, the works of the flesh are manifested, and these is adultery. If you're out there committing adultery and you're truly saved, okay, if you're fornicating and cleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderings, drunkenness, revilings, and the like. I tell you, I tell you before, I've told you in the past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. I was always taught that this means you're not going to heaven. You're going to hell. Well, that's not what is written scripture with scripture rightly dividing this will seriously affect who you are in christ and you will be without the gates you'll be saved but your works will all be burned and you'll be without the gates out in the dark there and as you'll be out there suffering trust me will you be saved for eternity yes you will not be in the hellfire lake of fire for eternal damnation and we all know what these mean, adultery, fornication, and cleanliness. Uncleanliness is so connected. There's a whole different study on this and lasciviousness. Basically, it's leaving a very sinful life. Idolatry, you know what that means, witchcraft, hatred, variance. That means taking, and emulations means taking what is written, God's law, and making your own devices and following after satanic ideals, causing wrath and strife, seditions, and all these heresies. So... And the other scripture that tells us about this pretty close is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, 9 through 11. And there's 9, 11. It says, no, the run righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. Okay. Thieves. Da -da -da -da. But some of you, look at that. As such were some of you, but you are washed, but you've sanctified. You're now justified in the name and by the spirit of God. Now, is Paul directing this to every single Corinthian? No. He said, some of you were washed. Some of you were out there. Some of the Corinthians, Paul was shocked at. He says, do not hang out with these. The ones that have come and said, now you're washed, meaning you've gone through, says, Lord, you've come before the Lord. And you said, Lord, I repent of these. I, I know I'm sin. I don't have to go into repentance for salvation but what i've done is wrong i know i'm your child thank you for forgiving me i don't have to ask forgiveness i am forgiven but i confess these things i turn from these things i will not do these things anymore yes we turn from that sin i kind of got off the subject here but know the difference between inheriting the kingdom and uh entering the kingdom we entered when we're saved we're sealed right then and there and I know I keep repeating myself, but the incorruptible crown for overcomers, this is not a salvation issue. This is a reward issue about reigning in our position. Please email me if you have questions. If you, if you disagree with me, let me know. I'll go through it scripture with scripture. I have thoroughly researched this. Doesn't mean that I have all the answers, God forbid. And I've learned from my brothers and sisters all the time. And I will just say this, the links I'm using here, it's really sad. The reason why I kept this link, this person does a great job of explaining the churches 
in Revelation, the seven churches in Revelation. By the way, those are actual churches. That's not for the tribulation saints. It can apply, will apply, but I'm talking, this is actually for the body of Christ in the church age. But this person does a great job. And guess what? They don't use a King James Bible. So what I'm going with is this person that's done this research, they think that they're striving lawfully. They're using a perverted Bible translation. They're going to have to answer for that at the beam seat. And if you think, well, why would you use that reference? Well, we're not legalistic here, people. If, like, for example, Dr. Andy Woods did a great study on the coming kingdom. Phenomenal piece of work. He uses a perverted Bible translation and where it tripped him up in terrible ways, I pointed it out. But my purpose here is just to show that these overcomers in Revelation. Now, read the links and study it, but I just want to go in here. These churches were actually churches. Please don't think this is talking to the tribulation saints. No, these were physical churches. Ephesus, Ephesians, Paul was so proud of them. He says, you're doing so great. But look, he says, you've lost your first love. You've fallen. Read how Paul, uh, this is a century or, or several years, 30 some years, I don't know, years before. Now they're fallen. Uh, maybe it was by the end of the first century. Here it is. The church had already become busy doing religious works. They had forgotten that the work was already done and our primary purpose is in Christ. The overcomer was the one who rested in faith and worship God. Now, let me tell you, in that church during that time, there were those that did not get their crowns. Trust me, they got caught up with the cares of the world. And Smyrna, I'm not going to take the time to read this. Read yourself. I'm taking too much time. The church of Smyrna was the reign of the Caesars. The overcomers did not lose their faith. They, they offered no escape. And they literally suffered unto death, many of them. That means they got the incorruptible crown. They got the crown of life. They have got the, their finished work. A crown for finishing their work. They got their crown, I'm sure, of righteousness. But maybe not all of them did. Maybe some of them were suffering, but they thought, ah, we're not looking for this our redemption here anytime soon. Overcomers in Pegram. Read this. This is the time right here, the fourth century church <laughs> in the pagan Babylonian religion. Do you want to know who that is? Figure it out. But this is when the overcomers in Thyatria, uh, Thyatria, Thyatria in Revelation 2.20, this is the full-blown representation of the Catholic Church and those that came out of that and stood against that. The overcomers in, the overcomers in Sardis, the overcomers in Philadelphia. Yes, this is like they say represents the true church, but do you know that the true church will still be those that will not get the crown? They may not get the crown of righteousness. They really are not longing for the appearing of Jesus Christ. They're really not seriously striving lawfully, but they, are, they rightly divide, meaning, I'm sorry, they rightly divide, so they're striving lawfully, but they may not be fully committed and take like, well, the Trinity really doesn't matter. It's not that important. I'm just giving you examples. I'm not getting religious here, hyper. Um, uh, I'm not getting religious here. And then the, and believe it or not, even in the Laodicean church, there are those who will stand and wake up and say, man, I got to get out of this false teaching. It happened to me. It happened to my other brothers and sisters. I came out of this fake false apostate church so anyway enough on that just know that the crowns are important know that the incorruptible crown the crown for the overcomer is what is spoken of in in uh, revelation it's all in here i do take great exception with the author He's saying that the evangelical church is the church of Philadelphia. Wrong. 
<laughs> See, this guy is so messed up here, but I don't, I don't know who this guy is, but he's wrong. But everything else, I like what he's done his research, but he's wrong. No, it will be some of the people that come <coughs> out of the evangelical church, but it's not the church of Philadelphia's evangelical, no. Also, there's an extent, I'm not going to read this, Appendix 3 goes in depth on these overcomers. Now, I really like this work here because he gives exegesical evidence, he gives historical evidence. Listen, there are people who say, oh no, every single Christian, when you're saved, you'll get your incorruptible crown. Because we're all overcomers, because we believe in the blood of the cross, and Christ overcame, he overcomes, and in that, in us, he and us is overcoming. No, read this carefully. It doesn't add up. You have to match scripture and harmonize scripture with scripture. All right? So there's that, and see if there's anything else. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I pray, Lord, that those can see and know that I will finish this uh, study with taking, Lord, for us to look for our blessed hope. That, Lord, we see that to have our rewards, we seek these things, Lord. And that, Lord, that we know that the third day prophecy spoken of in John, in John chapter 2 verses 1 in Exodus 19:11 does come in with the uh, sign of Jonah of the three days Lord and Lord in Hosea chapter 6 verse 2 I read after two days will he revive us and the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight Lord, we know that a thousand years is but one day to you, Lord, and that now we know that we're now in the third century. I pray, Lord, that as I go into this final conclusion of the sign of Jonah, that especially eyes could be opened and of how late in the hour we really are and what we're looking at here. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Maranatha. The third day... The day of Jonah, and this is the conclusion, and this is the height, the highlight, the climatic, powerful conclusion I want to make here. We know that our crowns are important, especially the incorruptible crown, all of our crowns. We should strive for those lawfully. <clears throat> because, Lord, because, listen, listener, we know that we're going to reign and rule with Christ. The Revelation 12 sign, it's all there in my studies. We know that we're now in the third day. Scripture has given us prophetic significance here. We see the connection of the wedding on the third day in John chapter 2. And I want to write here the in the Hebrew spelling in the third day, Notice how the third day matches with Cana as 155. Guess what that, let me back up here, I'm sorry. Notice that when you see the Hebrew term in Gematria findings, that the third day also means and has the value of rapture and that the church and Cana also have a numeric value of 155. And then when you take in the third day and write it all out, it literally comes up to be the gematria, the Hebrew spelling of the rapture. It's just shocking. I just wanted to share this with you. So we see that the wedding, the third day, the wedding is connected with the type, <clears throat> the typology of a Jewish wedding. I'm not going to read all this. We see also that the sabbatical cycle, there's a whole connection here. <clears throat> and their new sabbatical 
cycle begins here in September 2022, we see a huge connection there. We see the sign markers of Matthew 24, 7 and 8 like never before in, shocking, in a shocking way. Read and watch this Calvary prophecy video. We know that the church age is now currently in the third millennium. People, there's no, and, and don't come up here and say, oh, no, no, we, we don't know. The, the, you got to follow. You can't use a Gregorian calendar. You use a Hebrew. No, every, anybody with a half a mind knows that the garbage of these Jewish Zionists and these Messianic Jews and these Sabbath keepers, they say, oh, the Hebrew calendar. Don't use the Gregorian Western pagan calendar. Okay. Fine, but know that the Hebrew calendar is over 200 years off. Uh, Chuck Missler, God rest his soul, he did a great study on that about the seventh millennium and how the calendar error, it's called the, the great gap there. Some call it the, uh, let's see, the actual term here <clears throat> is called the, I'm sorry here, folks. Uh, the missing years, the Hebrew calendar missing years. So don't get hung up on calendars, but we know, take any calendar you want, we're in the third millennium. Take any calendar you want, we know that the, the, the world we're now in and have completed, we're in and finishing the sixth millennium since the creation. So we have that. There's so much here. Look at the study on the 153, the 153 fish, and the twinkling of an eye on the third day. Read this scripture in here about how this person did this incredible research here. Look how the third day is in Exodus 19. And look at that 15 day of separation there. People... You should be excited looking for these things. Stephen Dexter did all of his stuff in here. I'm not going to read all these. Please research here. Why am I excited about all these things? I'm waiting for my crown of righteousness. Waiting for the rapture was just like waiting for my dad to come home when I was a child and read that. I'm not going to take the time to read that. I'm going to read this and then just, uh, I'll finalize this. I am very certain that this coming spring through the summer of 2022 is a very high rapture watch time based on the compiled preponderance of biblical eschatological evidence as compared to the current events. And Terry Malone has laid it out so well. Wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes. Look at all these volcanoes blowing up all the time. Famine, pestilence, social unrest, and great apostasy. We have the third day prophecy and the third day fulfillment of Bible prophecy. An exposition of Hosea 6.2. Read that. We've got the seventh day prophecy. That's 7,000 years, the day of rest of human uh, since human existence, we have the Revelation 12 sign behind us in 2017. All of this combined with the timeline of the fig tree generation and the nation of Israel being established in 1948. Look at these sign markers of the, the, the Shemitah year. And again, the third day prophecy, Exodus 19.11, on the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of his people of Mount Sinai. Do you see these types and shadows, people? John 21.14, now the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was risen from the dead. And I already read this so many times after two days he will revive us. So yes, if the rapture does not happen this coming spring into the summer, Hey, that means we've still got more work to do. I'll look for the next high watch and then still think any day I wake up, it's going to happen. 
people were there. Be excited about it. Look for your crown of righteousness. Seek after your incorruptible. Seek after that incorruptible crown. Seek after your crown of joy. <clears throat> Seek after your crown of life. Seek after the of, of the crown of finishing your work. And I will, I must, I am going to find the name of seeking after the crown to finish your work. Oh my goodness, because I always say finish your work. Saint, seek after your crown of righteousness. Love the appearing of our Lord. Seek after, first and foremost, that, that incorruptible crown of overcoming. Seek after that crown of life, which is over, overcoming adversity, but living and truly knowing you're the Lord. So if you're saved, that one. Seek after the crown of glory, which is, that's it, glory, finishing your work. And the crown of rejoicing and joy, that means preaching the gospel everywhere you can. The right gospel, rightly divided. Saint, I Saints, I encourage you, be a shining light of brilliance. We're told that as some stars are in more intensity and shine brighter than others, it depends on our work and our accomplishments that have been recorded in heaven. Read my study that God keeps memorials, people. Don't think that God does not keep memorials. I'll include that in there also. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I pray that you bless this work for your glory, even so come soon. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Maranatha.